Okay. So I guess we're getting close to the time, and we're at the time. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Peter, and this talk is called Consistency Without Consensus. And I guess it's very similar to another talk that's coming up right after this, which is has a very similar title. I forget the name. But that one's cool, too. Go to that one. Um, as for this one, it's, it's ultimately a talk about distributed systems. So I'd like to start by talking a bit uh, distributed systems theory. So if you're a distributed programmer or you're interested in distributed programming, I'd, I guess I'd like to read a quote about the topic. And that is this, that distributed programming is the art of solving the same problem that you can solve on a single computer using multiple computers. Uh, I have another quote. And that is that distributed programming is generally a bad idea, and you should try to avoid it if possible. And I think like this is pretty intuitive. It's, I think it's easy to understand why this is true. So as an example, consider the case of setting a single variable, uh, or to use a more academic term, uh, setting a register. On a single computer, it's pretty easy. Like You load up IPython, and then you like, type that, and then you type that, and then you get that. right? And if you didn't observe that behavior, then there'd be something pretty fundamentally wrong with your computer, like something totally devastating to your ability to continue to program. Now consider the same interaction against a distributed system. And there's many ways to do it, but maybe here's one. You would curl a, a post request to some uh, restful endpoint, restish endpoint. You pass some data. And then, of course, you get you know, this back. It's like, OK, well, maybe, maybe it worked anyway. Let's try doing a get and an internal server error. right? It might as well be like an ASCII art middle finger, right, for all the good it does you. And this, what's crucial here is this, this isn't in any way abnormal, right? Like, whenever you interact with any distributed system, you see errors like this all the time. No matter how routine or conceptually simple what you're doing is, you have to deal with stuff on this level. And you have to deal with these failures and these errors that there's like myriad complex ways that everything can go wrong. And these are all things that we have to account for and defend against when we're doing distributed programming. So I'm not the first guy to recognize this. Even back in the days of like ARPANET, people knew uh, distributing, distributed programming was harder than regular programming. And so I came up with all these nice primitives and patterns to deal with the complexity. And in the early days, I will argue, the dominant primitive and pattern was this concept of the RPC. So this is saying that uh, network communication can be modeled like a function call. And we can kind of treat it in the same conceptual way. Unfortunately, there's a big difference between moving a program counter in a CPU and serializing a request, sending it over a network, and getting it back. And I'm going to argue that it's a difference not only in degree, but also in kind, a uh, fundamental difference. So next leap forward, I would argue, is uh, in the 90s, there is this thing called Corba and like all these middlewares. Has anybody used Corba before? I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, Corba was really bad. Um, so there, there was like a lot of things in Corba that they tried to use to make things easier. There's this thing called the distributed object paradigm. Uh, there's this thing they tried to implement called location transparency. Basically, if you held a reference to some object or some data, it shouldn't matter in the Corba world if it was like on your local machine or if it was on the other end of a network connection. Um, I'm going to argue that middlewares like went too far too fast and that uh, they treated the network kind of as more reliable than it, than it actually was. And they didn't provide good abstractions for dealing with the errors that networks uh, inevitably would give you. So we built a lot of systems with Corva. Like, if you're interacting with your bank these days, almost certainly you're going through some Corva layer at some point. Um, and uh, whether or not these systems are reliable is open for debate. But we didn't have really anything better to base our uh, built engineered systems on until, I will argue, the year 2000. And in that year, there was this thing called the CAP theorem uh, by this dude named Eric Brewer. And often, this is summarized kind of incorrectly as uh, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. You can pick two of them. Um, so more than anything, I'm going to argue that the CAP theorem represented like a fundamental shift in the way we look at distributed programming. Uh, specifically, that made us confront the reality of partitions. So partition tolerance is that the system continues to operate despite message loss 
due to network and node failure. That's one way to formulate the idea. And because we haven't yet invented like perfect networks, this is an invariant in distributed programming. Nodes are going to fail, the network's going to fail. So when we're constructing systems through the lens of the CAP theorem, we must choose P. We must choose partition tolerance. So you've probably seen this diagram. The CAP theorem says that we can't do that. We can't have all three. We've got to pick two. And because networks are fallible, we have to pick partition tolerance. So that leaves us with basically two options, right? So-called CP systems that choose consistency, and so-called AP systems that choose availability. So CP systems, forgive me if this is like uh, something you've all heard before, but it's important to lay the groundwork. CP systems, um, they're typically built around something called a consensus algorithm or a consensus protocol. Here's some examples. Paxos is maybe the most famous consensus protocol. There's some systems built on that. Uh, Doozer is one written in Go. Chubby is the Google Paxos implementation. There's another one called Zab, which is very similar, but not the same. Zookeeper uses Zab. Uh, Raft is the new like hipster consensus algorithm. There's a couple of things using Raft. Uh, Console is the latest and greatest. Etcd uses another implementation of Raft. There's still another one which is super academic. It's called View Stamp Replication. I'm not aware of any systems that are built using it, but it's a fun read if you're into this sort of thing. So these protocols are robust, and CP systems are often provably uh, reliable and correct, but they're relatively difficult to explain to the layperson, and as a result, they're kind of difficult to implement and debug and maintain. They're also relatively slow with kind of high operational latencies for every interaction and low operational throughput. So they're kind of unsuitable for a lot of things you want to use distributed systems for. For example, you probably couldn't store your tweet stream in a CP replicated log. For those kind of things, we need to consider the other side of the cap spectrum, which is AP. And this is choosing availability and partition tolerance. But so-called AP systems like these don't actually sacrifice consistency. They just use a different form of it. So CP systems are uh, strongly consistent, and AP systems are less than strongly consistent. And there's different types of less than strong consistency. I'm going to talk about one, which you've all probably heard of. It's called eventual consistency. And that basically means that you accept that some nodes in the system uh, may be stale at a given point in, the, in time, but you try to ensure that no nodes will be completely wrong. And so if that's your constraint, you can build systems in a way that uh, potentially satisfies it. So a lot of energy was spent in the last decade or so trying to get eventual consistency to work well in the general case. And these are some uh, products of that, of that energy. Um, a lot of them do a really admirable job, right? But the path to that uh, current state where we live today was a bumpy one, especially in the early days. There was a lot of frustration and uh, public failure. And I'm going to argue that it was a function of a gap between what people expected these systems to be able to do and what the systems actually promised or could do. And there was, and I'm going to argue continues to be, a large gap between the theoretical state of the art in AP information theory and the engineering practice that produces products like this. Now recently, relatively recently, there's been kind of a conceptual revolution. There's been a big leap that closes that gap, and that's ultimately what I'm going to talk about, consistency without consensus. So I'll explain what I think are two formulations of that idea, kind of the same idea. And they all have to do with this idea of failure. So partitioning in a network is one broad class of failure, but there's other like, more subtle ways that partitioning can happen. Um, specifically, messages in a network can be delayed. They can arrive out of order from the way they were sent. They can be dropped altogether, and they can be duplicated. And these are all invariants in, in our networks. We have to deal with these conditions. And one way, maybe the best way to deal with invariants is to allow them to happen. Allow them to happen without corrupting the system state that we build on top of it. So how can we, how can we allow these things to happen? And that's what these uh, solutions, that's what these big leaps, recent leaps, attempt to implement. So the first one, is this thing called the calm principle. Has anybody heard of this? Good. 
Great, I'm introducing you to new ideas. Calm stands for uh, consistency as logical monotonicity. And that's a big and abstract way of saying uh, a system can only really grow over time in one direction, or should, rather. So imagine uh, a number that you can only add to and never subtract from. The Bloom language, it's bloomlang.org, is built with this kind of guiding principle in mind. But it's a little bit abstract. So there's another formulation of this idea, which I think is a little easier to get your head around, and that's uh, so-called ACID 2.0. So probably you guys have heard of ACID in the context of databases, right? And I think, I forget what it's like. Atomicity, um, what's the other one? Consistency, is that right? Uh, independence? Isolation and durability, right? Uh, okay, so that's cool. That's like uh, RDBMSs are built on these principles. So some smart fella back around 20, 2009 or 2010, he was like, aha, I can use this acronym in the field of distributed systems. Uh, so uh, for him, ACID 2.0 is associative, associativity, commutativity, idempotency, and then he kind of ran out of stream, uh, steam, so he was like, okay, distributed, yeah, whatever. Um, and I'm going to argue this is basically the same idea as calm, but kind of reified, like made more concrete. And it means that uh, a system, which is ACID 2.0 compliant, has operations which satisfy all of these things. Well, the first three. Um, so that brings us kind of to the name of the talk, which is uh, CRDTs. CRDTs are conflict-free replicated data types, and it's a distributed data type, like a simple variable or a set, which is provably eventually consistent without consensus. So CRDTs achieve eventual consistency by using ACID 2.0 or CALM compliant operations. The seminal paper on CRDTs, like uh, the, the source material, is by this guy named uh, Mark Shapiro. He's, I think, of Microsoft, or formerly of Microsoft. But it's super academic and uh, kind of difficult to wrap your head around. And for me, at least, the best way to understand what is a CRDT is by example. So let's try that. Let's pick a motivating example. And I think the easiest one is something called an increment-only counter. So you can imagine what is a counter. It's a number you can add to or remove or, or subtract from. Um, but an increment-only counter is a replicated integer supporting operations increments to update and value to query. So plus one or read. So let's think about the... Uh, read's easy, right? You just read the value that's there. That shouldn't be too tricky. But let's think about the, the right operation, the, the plus. So what are the properties of, of addition, integer addition? Well, it turns out it is associative meaning this statement is true. And it is commutative, meaning that statement is true. But it's not idempotent, because that's, that's false. So addition by itself isn't a CRDT compliant, ACID 2.0 compliant, CALM compliant operation. So we have to play a little bit of a game to get an increment-only counter into CRDT semantics. So in the paper, he describes a uh, data type called a G counter, and it works like this. Let's say you have a, no, uh, a distributed system of three nodes. Each node is going to hold an array. And in the array, there's going to be three indices. On node one, let's say the red node, it's going to own the first index in that array. On node two, it's going to own the second index in that array, and so forth. Now let's, uh, and uh, crucially, the other indices represent the state of the machine, the corresponding machine. I hope I've made that clear with the colors. So let's consider how a write operation would work. Let's say someone comes along and issues a increment operation into this distributed system, and it just so happens to hit the second node. So what's going to happen is the second node is going to update its owned index in the array. And now the value of this counter is considered to be the sum of that array. So at the moment, the value is now 1. On the other nodes, the value is still 0. So in this way, it's an inconsistent state. But it's eventually consistent. We'll see how. OK, so that write operation worked. And now if someone else read from the second node, it would see the correct value. If they read from either of the other two nodes, they would see an incorrect value. 
The second node is now going to take ownership of this state change. He's going to propagate it to the other nodes in the system, whom he presumably knows about, knows how to contact them. So step one is to issue this uh, message up to node zero. But crucially, it's not a plus one. The message content says, I am node one, uh, the second node, and my value is currently one. That's, it's important that it not be plus one, because plus one, as we saw, isn't idempotent. But what I just said is, if that happens three or four times, the end state is going to be the same. Does the same thing down there. And now we have a consistent state. No matter which node you read from, you're going to see the same value, which is one. OK, let's consider another write operation, another increment, this time to this guy. Same thing. Now his state is two. He's going to propagate it there. So far, so good. But let's say that this message is lost or delayed. We have an inconsistent state in the overall system. That's not great. And it's going to stay there absent. Uh, the, the state's going to remain inconsistent absent some motivating condition. But check out what happens now if we get another plus one to the same node. It's going to replicate, remember, with these like state semantics. And if it makes it down there, we're suddenly consistent again. So that's cool. And again, if it gets duplicated, no change. We're still good. So this is cool. This is a way to make an increment-only counter work. Unfortunately, it does have some downsides. It requires that the list of nodes be both known to all nodes in the network and kind of static, because these arrays are like allocated in that way. So it turns out we can do a little bit better. And the paper talks about this, too. Um, let's consider a better way to do an increment-only counter. And for this, we turn to sets. So when you have a set rather than an integer, uh, your addition operator is a union. So let's run through the list again. If we have uh, a set containing one, union with a set containing two and three, that statement is true. So union operation is associative. Uh, that's also true, I hope is clear. So it's commutative. But handily, it's also idempotent. In other words, if you union a set containing a value with a set already containing that value, you get the identity set. So that's cool. Can we model this increment-only counter using sets instead of integers? Well, it turns out we can. But uh, it's a bit interesting, because the expression plus one isn't by itself unique. And in order for something to be in a set, it should be unique. So what we have to do for this to work is take a step back and cons consider our application domain. And we have to say, well, you're no longer just issuing a plus one into this increment-only distributed counter. You have to do something else to it. Let's say, for example, the counter represents the number of unique plays that a track on SoundCloud gets. And so what we can do is instead of saying plus one, we can send into the network uh, the user ID of the person who pressed play. And so this would be unique, because a user ID can only uniquely play a track once and can never revoke it, so it kind of makes sense. So now, here's what it looks like. Instead of an array, we have three sets, currently empty. And in order to compute the value of this replicated integer, of this uh, increment-only counter, we're going to compute the cardinality of these sets. And right now, there's nothing in them, so the cardinality is 0. Same basic state. OK, let's consider user ID 123 hits play on this track. Remember, this increment-only counter represents a single track. So that's going to hit one node randomly in our distributed system. It's going to enter that set. The same semantics for replicating that to the other sets. And now we have consistent, eventually consistent cardinality of one across this integer. Same thing, you can imagine, OK, exact same operations. So this is solving the same problem that the original array-based implementation did, but it relaxes this restriction of having to know a priori the uh, topology of our distributed network. So this is cool, and it works. So now, a brief interlude. CRDTs give us these really nice properties. They're a solution that give us these really nice properties that we want to leverage. And sometimes, that requires bending the definition of our problem to fit them. I think tomorrow morning, the keynote uh, is by this uh, beer ops 
uh, young woman, and she's going to talk about the DevOps revolution. And I'd like to draw a, a parallel here, an analogy. In the battle days, we used to build these binary artifacts, and we would all like, works on my machine, and then like throw it to the sysadmins, right? And then they say, you guys, you should run this in production, and you should get paged when it goes down, and you should scale it out. But we eventually recognized an invariant in software engineering, which was that as the authors of a piece of software, we are like uniquely qualified to run that piece of software in production. We're best, we're, the, we're, we're gonna be the best person to do it. So we had this like DevOps revolution, right? And we changed our methodology and we said, programmers are expected not just to type the code in, build a WAR file and then throw it at somebody, but to deploy it to our production ourselves and to monitor it and to get paged when it breaks and to fix it, and then to scale it down when, or scale it up when we need more capacity and scale it down when the uh, next version of the software comes along. And we're better for it as an industry, I think. All the best software shops work this way. I hope you work this way. If you don't, it's bad, you should feel bad. But we're, we're better for doing things this way. Similarly, if we, I would, I would say that we used to write distributed systems very optimistically. We categorically dismissed huge numbers of failure modes in our networks and everything, everything beneath that. But the CAP theorem came around and showed us that there are invariants in distributed programming that we need to design for and accommodate. And CRDTs, I believe, are the current like, best-in-class solution to deal with those invariants. So the fundamental argument that I'm making here is that as users and implementers of distributed systems, we should really we should be like ready, willing, and able to change our methodology, to change our way of thinking. And not to hold our problem invariant and say, I need to be able to say plus one. And the system needs to support that. And then try to bend the solutions that we have to fit that problem. Instead, hold your good solutions invariant. Understand what is a CRDT, for example. Understand what it requires of the uh, application domain. And then bend your problem to fit it. I believe that type of methodology, that type of thinking produces like better, more robust, more robust, simpler, more reliable software. And I think that benefits all of us. Okay, that's my little speech. And now we get to the interesting part, which is uh, CRDTs in production and the system I'm capable of talking about. So I, I work for this company. It's also there, that's cool. Um, we put your sounds in the cloud. Uh, we're ultimately, like many websites, we have a social network component. So if you create an account and you log in, you'll be encouraged to follow other users, other creators on the platform. And if you follow enough people, then uh, you have this thing called the stream, and you see all the things that they do, all the tracks they upload, all the uh, sets that they repost, and, and this sort of thing. So here's the stream. And the stream is not unlike the Facebook feed or the Twitter tweet timeline or whatever you can imagine. Uh, it's comprised of things we call events. And events all take basically the same form. Uh, an event is the timestamp of the thing that happens, uh, the user or the actor who did the thing, the verb of the thing that was done, like uploaded or reposted or something like this, and then a unique identifier of the thing to which the verb was applied. That sounds awkward, but I hope it's kind of clear what I mean. So as an example, uh, on the 26th of May at 12.04.56, Snoop Dogg might have reposted uh, The Economist's podcast or something like this. So that's an example of an event. Uh, unlikely, though it may be. Okay, so when you're constructing timeline services, tweet services, this sort of thing, um, I'm going to argue there's like two ways of doing it. And the first and kind of most obvious way is so-called fan out on right. So imagine this is your social network. Uh, you have your creator here on the left, and you have all of these uh, listeners on the right. And in this model, all the listeners get kind of an inbox. And so what happens is when, uh, assuming all these guys are following this guy, when he produces a new track or reposts something, what's going to happen is that's going to get written to the inboxes of everybody who follows him. And that's kind of the data model, fan out on right. So the locality of the data is very close to the consumer. Make sense? So there's another way, and so-called fan in on read. And in this model, the locality of the data is close to the producer. So when they upload or produce a new track or whatever, it goes into their outbox. 
And then what happens is, whenever I, as a listener, open up my stream page, what I'm going to do is query to see who I follow, go to all of their outboxes, and kind of pull in their recent stuff, merge it together, and then produce kind of a dynamic view of what my stream is at that point in time. Um, without getting into details, this carries a lot of advantages. You can think of it at a product level. It's much easier to do fun, dynamic things with your uh, stream if you can manipulate it kind of on the fly. So maybe there's a way we can, that our goal here is to implement a fan in on read model of the event stream, perhaps using CRDTs. Otherwise, this talk would be kind of uh, weird. So let's see. Um, is there a way we can do this with what we know already? Um, it turns out that events are unique in the sense that Snoop Dogg can only repost that one Economist podcast once. I like that. That is a, a unique formulation of this idea. It should only appear in the stream once. So maybe we can use the set. We already know about this G set, which is the one I described earlier, but it doesn't work because you can't delete from it. It's an increment only. You can only add things into it. Um, if you continue to read the seminal paper on CRDTs, he describes some other sets which you can delete from. He describes a 2P set, so-called 2P set. Uh, you can add and delete, but then you can never re-add again. So that's not great. There's another one called an OR set, an observe remove set. This does allow you to add and delete uh, kind of in indefinitely, but it comes coupled with a storage overhead that is um, not great for us. And uh, it also imposes some restrictions on the topology of the distributed system, which we, we don't want. But to summarize, all these sets kind of work in roughly the same way. All CRDT sets kind of work in roughly the same way, which is uh, as follows. There is a concept of a logical, a single logical set, which is split into two physical sets. There's a so-called add set, kind of like S plus. This contains all the elements that should be considered to be in the set. There's a so-called remove set, S minus. And then the way you produce, these are the two physical sets. The way you produce the logical set is by doing a semantic merge of them. So kind of if you merge A, B, C with B, then this is the result, right? So this is kind of conceptually how they all work. Um, so now I'm going to describe a new set that we kind of came up with, uh, which powers the SoundCloud stream. So here are the semantics. It's very similar. We still have an ad set, but we couple each element with a piece of metadata, which you can consider a score. It's actually the timestamp. I'll just have them as integers here for simplicity. There's still a remove set, exactly the same thing, and we still do the same semantic merging. But these timestamp metadata give us uh, a bonus feature, or a set of bonus features. So as in, just to, to make it clear what these things mean, um, the, the set key, the logical set name, would be the, uh, the user ID for whom the outbox represents. So for example, Snoop Dogg's outbox. The elements in that set are a unique combination of uh, the actor, the thing that was done, and the identifier. So this is actually the unique thing that should only appear once in any given stream. And then the extra piece of metadata, the score, is the timestamp of the event as it, as it was done. OK. So if that's our data model, then reading is easy. You just read the two sets, you perform the semantic merge, and then you're done. What's interesting is writing. And particularly, what's interesting is writing while ensuring these ACID 2.0 calm semantics are maintained. So let's consider the insert operation. Insert is always key element score. Here's how it works. If either the add set or the remove set for that key already contains the element, then you look at it. And if the existing score is greater than or equal to the score that you're trying to put in, the score you're trying to insert, then it's a no op and you exit. This means that if you insert an older element into your set, then it, it doesn't beat the existing element, so it's kind of dropped on the floor. Otherwise, you insert the incoming element into your ad set, and you delete any matching element from the delete set. And in this way, ensure that each element, each unique thing, only exists once in this outbox. OK, that's insert. You can imagine delete is actually exactly the same thing, except you swap 
inserting into the add set with inserting into the delete set, and vice versa. OK, that's a bit abstract. Let's look at an example. Um, let's consider that this is our current state. We have a set S, consider it Snoop Dogg's outbox. He has add set uh, elements A and B with scores of 1 and 2. Delete set element C, score of 3. And here comes a write operation, insert D4. Show of hands, who knows what happens? Where does it go? Where does it go? S plus. S plus, correct. Bonus point. You get a t-shirt. You already have a t-shirt. OK, that's clear, right? Because D doesn't exist anywhere. It can go into the ad set. Cool. Here comes another. Oh, it's the same operation again. What happens? Right? It detects it's there. The score doesn't beat it, so it's a no op and no state change. Insert D3. Correct. D3 does not beat D4. No state change. Delete D3. Like a broken record. That's right. We check both sets because D3 doesn't beat D4. Similarly, delete D4. It doesn't beat the existing store, so it's a no op. Aha, but delete D5. Hopefully not a no op. So we, we check both sets. We see D exists, but 5 beats 4. So 5 kills 4. D5 goes into the delete set. And now this is our state. If we had an insert D5, D5 does not beat D5, so it's a no-op. But a delete D6 would have the effect of updating the score on that element. OK, so that's how it feels, right? Everyone kind of like understand how that works? Um, and it looks pretty good on keynote slides, but the question now is we have to make it real, and we have to make it perform. So let's talk about making it real. And the question was, do we need to write new software to implement these kind of set semantics in the script I, just, I described? Uh, and it turns out we don't. It turns out that there's this thing in the world called Redis. And uh, Redis is a data structure server, not to be confused with a database. And Redis supports directly something called a sorted set, a Z set, uh, which provides exactly the semantics we want. It's add, remove, get the score. Redis also has this atomic Lua scripting, so that's really cool. Um, so we can safely implement our write operations. But our data set is large. Redis is an in-memory server. And so we don't fit the whole data set into one Redis instance. So naturally, we do what most people do, and we shard Redis instances. And this actually works really great, because we have a natural shard key. Every operation is always based around this set ID, set name. And uh, we can hash that and do really nice, uh, easy sharding at the application layer. So we wrote a very simple library, sit in front of a bunch of Redis instances, do that sharding for us. And then on top of that, we wrote something uh, called cluster. And that provides us a very simple insert, delete, select API uh, on, on top of the uh, shard API. OK, but remember, this still represents a single logical node in our distributed system. And by that, I mean that Snoop Dogg's outbox only appears once in all of these boxes. So in order for this to be a nice, reliable, distributed system, we want to replicate this picture. And indeed, that's what we do. As many times as you want, you replicate this stack. And what's interesting about this architecture is that none of these components talk to each other. right? None of the Redis's talk to each other. None of these cluster stacks talk to each other. And in this way, it's, I think, uh, a bit of a different architecture than you see in a lot of distributed systems where the nodes will kind of gossip with each other. Um, I'm going to argue that this makes this system better, more reliable, easier, easier to understand, easier to reason about, because it exposes it to fewer modes of failure. OK, so we have, finally, this uh, final layer which communicates with all the clusters. And we package the farm, the clusters, and the pool into a single binary, stateless binary, which communicates with all of the stateful Redis instances. So we can do horizontal scaling with this binary, uh, talking to the stateless, uh, stateful layer. And um, that's basically our system. So at this high level, writing is very easy. Every write operation should be sent to every cluster, because that's what you want. Straightforward. But reading is interesting here, because we have options. When a read request hits the farm layer, what do you do? Well, the easiest thing to do is just to send it to one cluster, pick randomly, sure, and return the result directly. This is cool. It's easy to understand. It's fast. You only have one network round trip. But you only get one response back. And if that cluster happens to be out of sync, inconsistent, we have no way to know. We just have to return the data back. 
The alternative is to send it to all the clusters. We can do this kind of efficiently. We can do a scatter gather uh, that bounds us to the slowest of the three uh, in this case. But it means that we get um, multiple responses back. And remember, these are sets that are coming back. So we can do interesting things with that. Let's say this is what we got back from such a request. Everything looks good except this last cluster apparently missed the B element somehow. So that means it's inconsistent. What do we do? Well, you can union all of these responses, and this is what you get. And it's interesting that this is actually the correct response. Right? This, is, this, is, this is what is provably totally correct. And it turns out, if you think about it, as long as each cluster has representation for each element at least once, at least once, then the union is going to be the overall correct response. And that's cool. We can send that back to the client. He doesn't see the inconsistency. There's another operation in set world called, I think, a symmetric difference, which uh, selects the things which aren't in perfect agreement across all the sets. In this case, it's the element B. And knowing that, we can then uh, compare. We can ask each cluster, what do you know about the element B? Get responses back. Compare the responses. Based on the scores, we can determine which one is the most correct and then perform a diff against the responses we got back, and then reissue write operations to the clusters that were inconsistent. So this is very similar to Cassandra read repair. In fact, it's called read repair. And so what we can do then is build this hybrid read strategy where we send the request to all the clusters, we return the first one that comes back, maybe it's inconsistent, but we linger around and we receive all the responses from the other clusters. We perform this diff, and um, when we see that there's anything inconsistent, we send the right operations all asynchronously. And in this way, the, the, the system kind of becomes self-repairing, assuming you have sufficient read volume. So that's like the incredibly fast five-minute overview of uh, this production CRDT system. The full thing is totally open source. Uh, we recently did a blog post. Uh, you can go to this website. We spent a lot of time uh, building a readme that I hope is easy to understand. The whole project is written in Go, except for the Redis bit. Um, it's about 2,500 lines altogether, so not that big. Easy to understand, I hope. And we're in the process of rolling it out um, to serve the stream to all of our users. We've load tested it very significantly uh, to several orders of magnitude uh, growth beyond what we currently have, several years of exponential growth ahead. So we're very confident. So this is the real deal, right? It's a production CRDT system built from first principles, simple and fast. Take a look. Okay. Conclusions. I think I still have two minutes. I think I am okay. Cool. So, consistency without consensus. Current best uh, option available in the field of distributed systems is the CRDT. Learn it, know it, love it. Taking a step back, speaking a bit more generally, every time you write software, you have to deal with invariants, whether they come from the business world or whether they come from like the structure, the, the, the grid of the technology that you build on top of. And it's a fool's errand, I'm arguing, to try to code them away. Rather, you should embrace them. You should acknowledge them as first order things. And you should bend what you're trying to do to them rather than trying to abstract them away. I think this is the lesson of successful distributed programming. And I've just said that, so I won't say it again. Uh, that's basically it. Thank you so much. I work for SoundCloud. If you want to work on hard problems like this, we're hiring. There's the website. And uh, maybe I have like, time for one or two quick questions, but thank you very much. Anybody? Two. Oh, sorry. There's, two There's one guy right behind you who is like... Oh, okay. Uh, how do you ensure that the timestamps are consistent or that they are monotonically increasing across yeah. different clusters? Yeah, so this is, uh, the question was how do you ensure the timestamps are consistent? Indeed, this is the problem that I've totally like glassed over. Um, the way we built the system was that uh, all of the events are coming from kind of uh, some source in the distance. And uh, the assumption in the system is that the timestamps that come with the events, and they, and they do come with the events, are correct. So if that's not true, uh, we're totally subservient to those uh, timestamps. And that is definitely a cheat in the system. There's this whole field of study like Lamport clocks, vector clocks that deal with uh, exactly this problem. And we chose not to address it in this, in this, in this system and like, exported that complexity to the producer side of the system.
One more. Okay, so I go. Um, what do you do if one of your clusters is so inconsistent that it's not acceptable for the user? So maybe you boot up a new node, it's empty. I mean, it would repair itself, but you can't give that to the user. It might be annoyed. Yeah, so um, this is an interesting case. You can't give it to the user, and in this hybrid mode that I showed at the end, you couldn't return that right away. So we hope in the general case of the operation of the system, no cluster falls into this state. But one interesting way of growing the system is indeed to boot up an empty cluster and let read repair just kind of fill it in uh, over time. And this works great, except you have to put a kind of a flag on that cluster. And you have to say, uh, this cluster can receive write operations, but it, you should never serve read operations from it directly. And so that's kind of how we deal with it. Uh, we could have a way of like dynamically uh, deducing uh, error rates from a cluster by cluster basis, and at some threshold, like kick it out. Uh, we don't currently do that, but that could be possible. Yeah. Okay. I think that's time. Thanks again.